thank you. Uh, Benham Ben Talablu is a senior fellow at the FDD with a particular focus on Iran non-proliferation. Uh, pro proliferation, uh, ballistic missiles, and international security. Uh, I, I just want to welcome him into the program. And uh, Ben, thank you for your time this morning. I, I just want to get your thoughts, uh, not just on the idea of self-defense here. We have heard from the IDF that uh, about 200 rockets have been launched from Lebanon toward Israel. But we're also dealing with more than just self-defense of the Israeli homeland. We're talking about regional security here as well. What can you tell us about that? That's right. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, listen, make no mistake, October 7 was a brutal terrorist attack and the latest iteration of the Israel-Gaza wars. But post-October 7, starting October 8, when Hezbollah entered the fight, when the Shia militias entered the fight, uh, when the Houthis in Yemen entered the fight, and then really historically and directly and overtly uh, on April 13 and 14, when the Iranian state fired ballistic missiles and cruise missiles and drones, they too entered the fight. And this is all part of a larger ring of fire strategy designed to uh, foster a sense of insecurity in Israel and play on a sense of desire for stability and restraint from America to get U.S. forces out, to cower the Arabs in the region, and to ultimately move towards uh, that death by a thousand cuts strategy against the Jewish state that you've, had, you've heard Iranian leaders speak of uh, for four plus decades now. You know, what's interesting to me is the idea of making a preemptive strike. Now, sometimes when it, you're dealing with an international conflict, people say, well, how can you strike someone before they actually did something to warrant that? But in this particular case, especially in light of the fact, Ben, that the IDF says some 200 rockets have actually been fired in from Lebanon, it seems to me that the Israelis got this right. They preemptively attempted to limit the damage and they seem to have been successful, at least thus far. Not only were they, I would say, successful thus far, uh, but you could even say they were a bit restrained. You can look at media reporting as late as 12 hours ago uh, that talked about Americans and the Israelis seeing something formulate uh, in Lebanon that they had not been seeing before, basically the beginnings of an attack. Whenever a group like this attacks, whether it's Hezbollah to the north of Israel or the Houthis, far to the south of Israel, they have to move rockets and missiles out of storage. They have to fuel these systems. They have to prep the drones on rail launchers. And all of this should be sending, and it indeed does send, satellite intelligence and signals above. So that's what allows the multi-tiered air and missile defense system in Israel to kick off and perform so well. And it does open opportunities for what military planners call left-of-launch operations, so operations that you can engage in to fire against the rocket or fire against the crew manning the rocket before they even fire at you. So given that the Israelis waited even this long, uh, shows a commendable amount of restraint uh, in my view. And for the people who are unaware, you heard mentioned perhaps earlier during our coverage, Trey Yanks, I thought, made a fantastic point. The Israelis aren't just dealing with Hamas or Hezbollah or the Houthis. I mean, they, they, they are really taking it in from all different sides here. And in a circumstance like this, in particular, as you mentioned, where you know or certainly have reason to suspect you're about to face an imminent attack, uh, they certainly have been uh, up to it, at least, it would appear, certainly. What's your thought about that? Yeah, certainly restrained. And also, to me, uh, as an American, looking at this conflict for 10, 11 months now, I've got to tell you, it also shows how much the Israelis prioritize the tight military-to-military -military coordination that exists with them and the Americans, and more importantly, uh, the politics and the optics of the situation. Uh, the allies of the adversaries of America, the adversaries of Israel, are trying to foster distrust between the strategic partnership. The Islamic Republic of Iran is trying to break these bonds between America and Israel. The Ring of Fire strategy is designed to break this bond. Uh, it's designed to, to make, allow America to essentially cut Israel loose. Uh, and the way the Israelis have been keeping the U.S. apace of the targeting, of the intelligence, of the next phase of the operations is preventing this political strategy from the acts of resistance to be actualized. So again, uh, it's an important move, uh, but it's also a move that has much more than just military ramifications. It has significant political ramifications for the level of U.S. support to Israel in the next phase of this fight. And that's something that could be a bit wobbly in the next few months, given politics back in Washington, uh, and of course, given how the election may go. 
Boy, I'm so glad you mentioned that, too, because certainly here in the nation's capital, all eyes, not just on the election, but how that might impact uh, U.S. support for the Israelis moving forward and what might happen in the region. Uh, ben, I'm ben Talablu, senior fellow at FDD, thank you so much for your time this morning. We certainly appreciate that. We are continuing our coverage here on the ongoing conflict in Israel, and in particular uh, as they defend themselves from Hezbollah. We're going to take a very quick time out. I'm Kevin Cork here in Washington. Chan Lee Painter joining us from New York. We'll be back with more. And after. Trey, joining us live now, Rich Goldberg on the phone, senior advisor at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thanks, Rich, for being with us this evening. Uh, first, I just want to get your reaction to what has happened in the last hours of Israel preemptively striking what they, their intelligence showed was a strike coming from Hezbollah from Lebanon. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me on. I think we were minutes away from mm -hmm. potentially a major escalation, much farther beyond what we have seen so far if not for what has to have been very precise, incredible intelligence obtained by the Israelis in some way. The fact that they knew precisely where to hit uh, missiles, we are told, that uh, may have been aimed for 5 a.m. at Tel Aviv at major sites that could have taken down either uh, government sites, military sites, or civilian sites. I'm sure we'll learn more in the coming hours of days. But the preemptive nature of the strike really taking care of that threat, and you're already seeing in my view, has a little, the very weak response out of the gate, uh, not uh, directing a retaliation into Tel Aviv or into Haifa yet at this point. That could still happen in the days ahead. Uh, but for now, it looks like Hezbollah looking for an off-ramp and Israel being willing to uh, stay at this point with its preemptive strike. Rich, speak to the intelligence that goes into something like this on the Israeli Israeli side to be so precise, to know what's coming, as you said, within the minutes that they were anticipating Hezbollah striking into the country. Well, think about the last few weeks. I mean, the nature of their intelligence operation, being able to pierce inside Hezbollah to get Fuad Shukr, the chief of staff of Hezbollah, and according to some reports, even lure him into a higher floor before striking and taking him out in a very precise strike. Hours later, taking out Ismail Haniyeh, the head of Hamas, while he's in Tehran, of all places, under the guard of the Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran. Now this preemptive strike. So if you're the supreme leader in Iran, if you're Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, you must understand at this point that Israel is heavily penetrated within your operation. Right. Do we still have Rich? Yep, go ahead. I, I couldn't hear you for a second. Rich, you're you're absolutely correct. And all of this, again, the goal to avoid some sort of a larger conflict in the region. Rich, nobody wants this to escalate in any way. Well, I, I think a really important takeaway tonight is to think about the context and the timing of what was supposed to be, we're told, a major spectacular attack by Hezbollah on Tel Aviv, potentially, which would have set off a major response from the Israelis all the way to Beirut, and perhaps Iran planning something that was going to come immediately afterwards, all of that preempted. But why do that on the weekend where we're told Hamas has sent representatives to Cairo we're so close to a bridging proposal for a ceasefire in Gaza. If Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas were in any way seriously trying to negotiate a ceasefire in Gaza, there would be a ceasefire in Gaza. This reminds us who is pulling the strings in all of these arenas. It's Iran, Hezbollah, its flagship terrorist organization. We need to stop putting pressure on Israel to surrender at the negotiating table to Hamas and Gaza. You need to start dealing with the head of this octopus that's controlling all of these fronts, and that's in Tehran. Iran making an unprecedented strike last April, directly targeting Israel, but still yet now using their proxies like Hezbollah, Hamas to strike the country. Uh, what do you see as far as what comes next? We know the uh, Security Council meeting right now in Israel prepared for what may be another phase. Hezbollah is calling this phase one or the phase, the first phase of their retaliatory strikes. What do you see coming next, Rich? 
Well, I saw the Hezbollah statement come out. It, it read a little bit like a Beirut Bob, if you will, uh, following the preemptive strike from Israel. So I'm not sure uh, how much seriousness to take that, uh, that statement with. However, you would imagine that they still want to try to attack and show that they can get through Israel's air defense, so there may still be another wave to come, whether it is tonight, whether it's next week, or some other time of their choosing. Uh, Israel needs to, however, stay on offense here. I think that's the key takeaway. It can't just become a turtle where they're waiting for the next incoming salvo from Iran or from Hezbollah or waiting for Godot at the negotiating table with Hamas. They need to turn the tables and go on offense on what is really a seven-front war they are facing since October 7th, led by Iran. Right. They were they went on the offense uh, tonight, this morning, and possibly saving a lot of lives there. Rich Goldberg, thank you so much for your time this morning. Kevin, I'll send it over to you. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks, Trey. So let's bring in Rich Goldberg, senior advisor at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Rich, let's talk about what Trey was just reporting on there. The unbelievable numbers of rockets, the precision of Israelis' offensive uh, pre-striking what could have been a devastating attack from Hezbollah uh, from Lebanon. And Trey says this may have avoided what everyone was hoping to avoid, a larger scale conflict in the region. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that's exactly right. I mean, if, if what we are hearing is true, 6,000 long-range missiles, short-range rockets, drones, all prepared to launch on major cities in Israel, including Tel Aviv, and they were all wiped out by the Israeli military preemptively. First of all, what a breathtaking, stunning uh, decision by Iran and Hezbollah to be willing to launch that attack. Number two, what a stunning and breathtaking preemptive strike and the success of the Israeli military in thwarting that attack. And clearly the message it sends, not just in Beirut, but in Tehran. I'll make one very big, important point that I think everybody should take away from this. Because you'll remember, we're just weeks, months after there was a big controversy over the Biden administration withholding weapon systems from Israel over disagreements on Israel's strategy against Hamas in Gaza. The munitions that you saw employed tonight, the fighter aircraft that were employed tonight, American-made fighter jets, American missiles, bombs, munitions that are being provided to Israel that were deemed offensive in nature are key to Israel's defense. You cannot have a defense without an offense. Israel just showed that tonight. And so when we talk about politicians saying we should support Israel's right to defend itself, that commitment cannot be limited to things like the Iron Dome missile defense system or the Aero missile defense system. Those obviously are important and need to be supported. But it means jet fighters. It means JDAM missiles. It means small diameter bombs. It means the Mark 82 and Mark 84, 500 pound and 2,000 pound bombs. It means all of those platforms and munitions that the White House deemed offensive in nature earlier this year because there is no defense without an offense. And in fact, if you have that offense and can launch a preemptive strike like this, you can actually prevent major escalation. It's, it's so impressive. Uh, Rich, I do want to ask you about during this preemptive attack, Hezbollah was launching drones and rockets into northern Israel at the same time, releasing a statement some 320 into the country, uh, uh, targeting 11 Israeli military sites. Does that action in retaliation, is that enough for Iran and Hezbollah to say, OK, we've done our part or to tell their people we've done our part in avenging the death of our leaders? Well, what I think it probably is for now is a placeholder. Uh, I think they're caught by surprise at the nature of the intelligence penetration, the preemptive strike, the success uh, of the Israeli military in taking out 6,000 platforms ready to launch. And so what you really saw was basically a, a little bit of an escalation above what we see almost on a daily basis just a little bit more into towns around northern Israel. It sounds like one injury uh, potentially uh, in the city of Akko, uh, north of Haifa. Uh, but otherwise, the areas that we see them targeting are not foreign to, uh, to Israelis at this point. 
So I think they're trying to get off what they have available in areas that are not going to prompt further major escalation all the way up to Beirut for now as they reassess what just happened and what they're going to do next. Rich, we're just receiving a statement from the Israeli foreign minister addressing dozens of foreign ministers around the world, calling on them to support Israel. The foreign minister stressing Israel acted after definitively identifying a large-scale planned attack of missiles and drones by the terrorist organization Hezbollah, it says in this statement, towards targets in Israel and carried out these preemptive strikes to thwart that attack. Uh, what do you make of the minister there calling on other foreign leaders to stand by Israel in this uh, offensive? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what I would expect uh, the Israeli foreign minister to say. Obviously, that's his job to, uh, to rally diplomatic support at a moment like this. Uh, I think the most important message tonight is going to have to be sent from the White House through appropriate channels, which are available directly to the regime in Tehran. They see two carrier strike groups now in the region. They see a massive amount of firepower from the United States military. They now see Israel not just penetrating their own intelligence services, but Hezbollah as well. Uh, there needs to be a very clear message sent to Tehran reminding them that there is that firepower in the region. And hopefully that there's a political will in the White House that that firepower isn't just there for augmenting missile defense of Israel, but in case Iran decides to escalate. Because hopefully this is a moment where Israel continues to degrade the capabilities of Iran's proxies, uh, actually tries to restore some modicum of deterrence, not just on its northern border, but throughout this uh, seven-front uh, fight that Iran is waging, uh, and actually can then make progress in a ceasefire negotiation by showing that it's willing to continue to close in on Sinwar in Gaza, the Hamas leader in Gaza, take it to Hezbollah in Lebanon, take it inside Tehran uh, to, to high-level assets, uh, and see if that can, combined with U.S. threats behind the scenes, actually achieve some sort of deterrence. And Rich, one last thing. I'm, I'm running out of some time here. Again, the minister saying that Israel doesn't seek this all-out war against um, Iran-backed proxies or Hezbollah. They're fighting a war in Gaza. But the, at this juncture, I only have a few seconds, Israel hitting targets in... Oh, I'm out of time, Rich. I'm going to have to go to break. Thank you for your time. Um, again, if you're just joining us, Israel says we're carrying... Uh, they carried out preemptive strikes overnight. We're going to squeeze in this break and come right back with the latest update. Stay with us here on the Fox News Channel. Welcome back, everybody. As we continue our coverage here on Fox News Channel overnight, we are continuing our watch of what's happening in the Middle East. Israel taking a preemptive strike on Hezbollah, uh, knocking out several targets in Lebanon. We are joined by David Dowd of the FDD. Uh, David, uh, a senior fellow. And, and I just want to ask you, David, uh, this is really fascinating for me. I actually had a chance to read your piece in Haaretz on why a ceasefire deal with Hezbollah is at least right now, would be bad for Israel. Explain that for the folks at home who may not understand the nuances of that argument. Um, thank you for having me on. Well, uh, let's start with uh, what Hezbollah sought to accomplish uh, by entering this conflict. Uh, Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah declared on November 3rd, the first time he addressed uh, uh, the attack, the massive attack that Hezbollah's allies, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, these other Gaza-based terror groups had launched mm -hmm. on Israel on October 7th, said the goal was to essentially force Israel through attrition into a premature ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. Um, and this is by adding the second support front from Lebanon, so that, he said, the Palestinian resistance, specifically Hamas, would emerge victorious. Now, if Hezbollah's attacks had forced a total ceasefire, uh, that would have been one component of where they would have claimed victory. The second part is really what's happening on the north, um, in that 80,000, 60,000 to 80,000 Israelis have been displaced from the north. You have this 10-month war of attrition that's been going on in the north. Um, yeah, and, poor uh, folks the in the Golan of, Heights, for example. Exactly. And, the, and the, the power of Israeli military arms alone has not been able to um, silence Hezbollah's guns, uh, to push Hezbollah from the border, uh, to get them to back down from this demand that they were making, uh, Hezbollah, that is, uh, that uh, they would continue attacking Israel until a prior ceasefire in Gaza. 
So that would have been another uh, element of this claimed victory that, hey, the Israelis uh, couldn't, couldn't push us back. The third element um, that, that one could argue that, that Hezbollah would claim is that, again, 60 to 80,000 Israelis have been displaced from the north. A de facto security buffer has been created in northern Israel that's about five kilometers deep from where, whence these people have been displaced. And again, the power of military arms alone, Israeli military arms alone, could not reverse the situation. Hezbollah could turn to its base and say, you know, the Israelis had to come beg us uh, to, for their, their settlers, as they would put it, to return to these colonies in northern occupied Palestine. And they would frame this, I would assume, uh, as a victory larger than the one that they claimed to have achieved in May of 2000 when Israel withdrew from South Lebanon. Because they could frame this as, well, in May of 2000, we pushed the Israelis out of South Lebanon. In, in, in 2024, we pushed them out of northern Israel. And the international okay. community had to come beg us to allow these people to return to their homes. You see the, the liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea is achievable. We just showed you how it was. Stay the course. And, uh, you know, whatever pain, sweat, and tears you have to achieve, it, this is an achievable goal. Or endure, it rather, is a, this is an achievable goal. It is a fascinating read, and I just want to share for the folks at home very quickly, we got a statement from the foreign minister, uh, Minister Katz, emphasizing that Israel does not seek an all-out war and will act accordingly to developments on the ground, uh, a statement that we've just received uh, within the last hour. This is a precarious moment, not just for Israel, but for the entire region. They have acted preemptively. We've heard Trey Yingst and Jeff Paul and others uh, mentioning tonight that in preparation for what could have been a catastrophe, an absolute catastrophic attack on Israel, Hezbollah apparently had some 6,000 missiles at the ready, and they were, many of them, if not all of them, were taken out by the IDF. We are short of time uh, for this particular segment, but we want to welcome back the Foundation for Defense of Democracy senior fellow David Dowd to chat with us again a little bit later. Again, I want to share with the folks at home, this is what's on X. The minister emphasized that Israel is acting to protect its citizens and territory against the Axis of evil led by Iran. So let's go now to David Dowd at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. David's on the phone. David, thank you for joining us this morning. I first want to get your reaction to what Jeff has been telling us, the scale of this preemptive attack from Israel to uh, possibly avoid this larger conflict. Uh, the numbers of rockets, 6,000 some rockets were set to be fired into Israel to major population centers of that country. Uh, here, Israel striking back on the offensive, making a very strong statement, did they not, David? Um, well, yes. So, look, it's unclear uh, where these, and it's not just rockets, it was uh, the idea uh, identified um, uh, drones, UAVs, and uh, rockets, a mixture of, 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 of these three types of projectiles. It's unclear where they would have been headed, whether these would have been population centers, whether they would have been uh, you know, Israeli military bases, whether they were intended uh, to hit open air areas. Let's, let's not forget that um, Hezbollah really does not want a war with Israel right now. Uh, you know, when, when they uh, killed the 12 Israeli children uh, in, in Majdal Shams, uh, on, on July 27th, they forced Israel's hand uh, to uh, to attack uh, and kill Fuad Shukri in Beirut, and um, uh, that in turn forced Hezbollah's hand uh, to carry out the spectacular, some kind of a spectacular attack. But at the same time, they were always trying to thread this needle uh, between uh, you know re retaliating in kind for the attack, but not giving the Israelis the justification to go to go to full war. And I think with the preemptive strike, the demonstration of Israeli capability uh, of intelligence, uh, the, the capability of Israel's intelligence and its, 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 its kinetic arms, uh, definitely that's going to put Hezbollah on notice a lot more. Uh, that uh, attacking Israel isn't going to be so easy. Right, we do know that now the Israeli military spokesperson, David, uh, saying Hezbollah was planning to target mostly the north of Israel, but also had some targets in central Israel for this scale of the attack. Speak to the intelligence that went into this for Israel to be on the offensive, possibly saving many, many lives, David. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, this, this this isn't just signal intelligence that can pick up the locations uh, of these of these attacks. The timing of the attack, uh, uh, I'm not sure how how much has been reported tonight, but uh, there were already reports in Israeli media uh, starting yesterday that uh, Hezbollah's attack would come soon, much sooner than anticipated, that the organization um, had uh, noticed that uh, talks, ceasefire talks, which had justified the delay uh, in the retaliation for Fouad Shukr, the assassinated uh, 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 chief of staff, uh, that these talks were snagging and uh, that, you know, Hezbollah was going to attack imminently. This is not something that you just pick up uh, through signals intelligence. This means the Israelis have extensive uh, networks within Lebanon uh, that, that is able to call this kind of information uh, and from which they're able to determine the exact timing of Hezbollah's attacks. And again, the, the preemptive strike itself. Um, so to, to start, uh, the IDF hasn't confirmed yet that uh, Tel Aviv was necessarily the target. They've said uh, central Israel. Uh, but to even know that, uh, again, takes a great deal of intelligence gathering, a great deal of intelligence capability, um, and to find the locations of these launchers uh, from when this attack was going to be launched. That, that demonstrates an, intel an impressive uh, intelligence gathering capability. And David, we're just receiving some highlights from the IDF international spokesperson saying that this was an act of self-defense on behalf of Israel. A little before 5 a.m. local time there in the country, mm -hmm. Israel, Israel used 100 airplanes, thousands of targets, and 40 launchers in southern Lebanon, most of them in south Lebanon, it says. The launchers were targeting, um, were mostly that they shot, were targeting northern Israel, but some in central Israel, as we just stated as well. But this, Israel says, was part of a larger planned attack, and the IDF thwarted it in a precise mm -hmm. manner on that home front here. Uh, moving forward, we know right now Benjamin Netanyahu's meeting with his Security Council, planning what could be next steps. What do you anticipate, David? Um, well, I think the Israelis are going to remain on high alert uh, for the next couple of days. Really, the, the, the next steps depend on, on Hezbollah. Uh, this really, you know, Hezbollah still managed to get off about, they're claiming 320 attacks, or sorry, 320 rockets. Um, the IDF, uh, from what I'm seeing from uh, Galetzal, IDF radio, uh, identified a much lower number of 210 rockets and 20 drones. Uh, nevertheless, they were able to get off uh, a barrage. Uh, the barrage uh, has caused relatively minimal damage, um, and I think the Israelis are going to react accordingly. Had these had, had, had this barrage caused more casualties, which was a risk that Hezbollah was taking, then there would be possibly uh, a commensurate uh, or proportionate strike from the Israelis. I think now they're going to uh, try to calm the situation. Um, I think Hezbollah has an interest in, in kind of returning. Uh, to, to the routine. It remains to be seen if this will be the last attack that Hezbollah conducts. They did call this a preliminary strike. They're calling this a success, uh, not to be deterred by reality. Hezbollah is going to call this a success. Um, this is more meant for domestic consumption to its base, to show that they are capable of matching the Israelis toe for toe, or, uh, and uh, right. are going toe to toe with the Israelis. It doesn't right. have to do anything with reality. They're David, trying to we, get, we got to cut to break right now. We'll be right yeah. back with you after this. Uh, ben, um, ben uh, Talablu has been uh, having a conversation with us overnight as we continue to unpack what is happening as the Israelis try to defend themselves against Hezbollah. Uh, ben, I want to ask you a question, if you'll pardon me for broadening out just a bit. We all understand that Iran is behind Hezbollah. But I'm curious, given the death, recent death of their president, how much of this impacts what they are attempting to do in the region? Does that throw them off kilter at all? Do they double down on their attacks on Israel? Uh, help me make sense of that. Well, certainly the uh, Iranians are looking at the success of the Israeli preemptive strike. Uh, and are worried again. Any blow to Hezbollah is a blow to the major uh, it military force. It sounds like we may have, have lost Ben for just a moment there. Uh, we were asking Ben uh, his perspective on what perhaps could be behind I Iran's continued support of Hezbollah, to say nothing of the Houthis and and so many other uh, groups and Hamas. Uh, you can certainly Hello. argue they are also behind them in the region. We'll try to get Ben back here in just a moment. Uh, we've been continuing our coverage here tonight because Hezbollah claims this is just the first phase 
of what they claim is a retaliation against Israel. We've also learned that obviously we are talking about the possible destruction of a number of facilities in and around the areas not terribly far from Beirut. We'll have to exactly drill down on where uh, some of these strikes ta have taken place. We do know that more than 100 Israeli aircraft have been involved in these precision strikes. And as we continue to get first day of light pictures from the area and in and around the region, we continue to unpack exactly what this might mean moving forward, in particular given that the Israelis continue to have to battle not just Hezbollah, but also Hamas and the Houthis and other Iran-backed militias all over the region, including in Yemen, Syria, and Gaza, and Iraq. Let's see, do we have Ben back? Greetings. Can you hear me now? I Hello? don't hear Ben. So at this point, Hello? I also want to take, there we go. It sounds like I have Ben now. Ben, can you hear me? It's Kevin Cork in Washington. Loud and clear, Kevin, can you hear me? I sure can. I was asking you earlier uh, what, if anything, we can make of this idea that Iran, maybe being a little off kilter, having lost a president not terribly long ago, is continuing to lash out. Maybe they're playing this partially to a domestic audience, this idea of we're going to retaliate, especially given that there have been leaders who have been felled at the hands of the Israelis. Is that your sense, or am I reading too much into where the Iranians might be at this stage? Certainly the success of the preemptive Israeli operation is a setback for the Islamic Republic, as, of course, uh, is the loss of Ismail Haniyeh, which was not just a, a political or a military loss. It was a major loss of face and an embarrassment. Uh, but make no mistake, this is a regime that bides its time. Uh, it has had a nuclear program in one shape or another since as long as it's been around. Uh, it's remained the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism for decades. And unfortunately, even with the success of this Israeli strike in Lebanon, today, uh, the Islamic Republic is looking at the regional chessboard, looking at the ring of fire it's arrayed around Israel, and looking at the success of uh, its political strategy of preying on America's desire for de-escalation and restraint, and saying, hey, I'm not doing too bad here. I'm fighting a seven-front war nearly for free against Israel for 10, 11 months, and I'm doing all these things on the U.S. home front, like hacking the election, still have an assassination order out to get uh, President Trump, uh, and, and all of the rest, and I'm still standing. So I think from their perspective, eerily and dangerously, uh, they are not deterred. I want to get your reaction, if I can. I just received this uh, statement. Uh, from Hezbollah. It says, we launched an offensive toward Israel. Our military operation for today has been completed. It goes on to say this, with Allah's help, all offensive drones were launched at their designated times from all their positions and crossed the Lebanese-Palestinian borders toward the intended targets from multiple paths. Thus, our military operation for today has been completed and accomplished. Praise be to Allah. Your thoughts? I think that the several references there in, the, in that uh, statement or press release to the completed military operation uh, is brought to you by the success of the Israeli preemptive operation. Uh, it, it casts a strong military shadow uh, over their capabilities, but it also impacted them politically and psychologically, at least for the short term. So I think their emphasis on the completed operation uh, is them briefly, very briefly, I would say, taking the knee, uh, but also trying to win, lose this battle, but stay in the game to win the war. Uh, so that's how I would read uh, this statement. Let me uh, share the IDF. Uh, I believe the IDF has a tweet or perhaps uh, a post on X or a statement. Let me share uh, that as uh, I continue to dig through my paperwork here. Uh, here it is right here. This is from the IDF on X. It says approximately 100 IAF fighter jets struck and eliminated thousands of Hezbollah rocket launchers aimed for immediate fire toward northern and central Israel. More than 40 Hezbollah launch areas were struck. When they talk about more than 40 Hezbollah launch areas, what does that mean tactically? It also adds this, by the way, we will do whatever is needed to defend our civilians and the state of Israel. When you're talking about 40 different areas, uh, walk me through that. That does speak to the precision of the IDF, does it not? 
Oh, for certainly the precision, but also the intelligence and also uh, in terms of linking up a lot of the technical system that may be able to detect a weapon before actually it goes off, as well as to some of the intelligence about where these projectiles are fueled, where they're stored, where they're transported, as well as the mechanics of where are they actually uh, getting, uh, fixing, uh, and using uh, these rail launchers or transporter erector launchers to get uh, these projectiles up into the air. So, again, a major intelligence win for the Israelis as much as it is a political win uh, and a military win there. But again, as the whole post-October 7 Middle East has shown, there is no time for a victory lap. This is an important notch, but we have to move to the next phase uh, of operations, whether that's political or militarily, uh, because Hezbollah nor any other member of this Iran-backed axis of resistance uh, has fully backed down. They are taking some tactical losses. Uh, they are getting major costs imposed on them by Israeli military success and uh, very limited U.S. use of force there, about 11 times against Iran-backed militias, despite being struck 175 times. But that statement uh, conveys, I think, the prowess uh, of the IDF and also the depth of the intelligence that they had and they acted on uh, to stop those projectiles from being fired towards the Jewish state. Benham Ben Talablu joining us from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies as we continue our coverage here on Fox News Channel. Hezbollah claiming success in strikes against Israel in a, quote, first phase of retaliation. We, we want to welcome in David Dowd. Uh, we've had a chance to chat with David earlier, of course, a senior fellow with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Uh, David, I, I was asking Jeff how the Biden administration's position vis-a-vis -vis Israel defense of itself, vis-a-vis -vis the ongoings in Gaza, is impacting what's happening there in the region. I just want you, if you wouldn't mind, weigh in on that. How do you feel they are doing and what happens uh, from the administration's perspective on the heels of what has happened overnight? Well, I think it's very important uh, for the United States to demonstrate that it is fully backing Israel's uh, ability to defend itself. Uh, the way Israel's, uh, and mind you, our adversaries in the region, uh, because let's remember, Iran has below the resistance axis, the U.S. as their primary enemy, uh, and the Israelis as a secondary enemy. The way they perceive this is that Israel is an extension, and I'm quoting, a forward military base, a tool of the United States. And uh, that, uh, you know, I'm quoting Hassan Nasrallah, the secretary general of Hezbollah, who said that when the Americans put their foot down, uh, the Israelis quake in fear. When the United States stops weapon shipments, the Israeli military chief of staff uh, starts counting how many projectiles he has in his arsenal. So the way they look at it, the more backing we give the Israelis to defend themselves by themselves, the more freedom of action the Israelis have. And the more we put pressure on Israel, the more we restrain Israel, the more we uh, halt weapons shipments, push the Israelis into a corner, the more Israel's adversaries feel that they have uh, room to act. So it is essential uh, that we back Israel's ability to defend itself. And that's Israel's utility, by the way, to the United States. It is an ally that is capable of defending itself by itself without the intervention of American forces. David, one of the things I've been struck by overnight is this idea of gaining intelligence to sort of game this out before 6,000 rockets or perhaps even more have been launched into northern and central Israel. Talk to me about the infiltration or at least the possibility thereof and how important it is to get essential intelligence to thwart possible attacks like this. I, mean, I think it's it's absolutely vital. Uh, as I as I told your colleague earlier, uh, this isn't uh, the information that it would have t taken to uh, the intelligence that it would have taken to foil uh, this massive attack that Hezbollah was planning. It's not something that you can get just from signals intelligence. It's something that you need that you can only get uh, from on the ground intelligence. And the Israelis, uh, time and again, both in this attack uh, and their uh, repeated ability to assassinate um, high-ranking commanders within Hezbollah. Uh, including and up to Fouad Shukr, uh, the, uh, the uh, chief of staff of Hezbollah that was killed earlier this month. That mm -hmm. requires precise on-the-ground intelligence. When people don't understand why this is important to, say, the American who's sitting in a Barca lounger in Pampa, Texas, I try mm -hmm. to explain to them from a global perspective how things that happen there can impact those of us here. 
Can you sort of unpack that in brief and why when this happens and strikes like this happen and when attacks mm -hmm. like these are thwarted, that matters to Americans, not just those serving in uniform and overseas, but also those of us here? Look, uh, we're a country blessed by geography. Uh, our closest uh, enemies are thousands of miles away, thankfully. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gives us kind of a skewed perspective of, of the threats that face us. Um, but like, like I mentioned earlier, the Iranian-led resistance axis, of which Hezbollah is the star uh, element, uh, view themselves in a for lack of a better word, a clash of civilizations uh, between their uh, governance model, which is based on a, uh, a Shiite uh, religious theocratic model that is according to Iran's specific interpretation of Shia Islam, that is juxtaposed and in opposition to uh, what they call capitalism. And they don't just mean a financial system, they mean a whole way of life, a whole cultural way of life, uh, which they view the United States as being at the forefront of. So they are in a primary competition with the United States. And they said that the way they see this playing out is to erase every bit of uh, American presence, uh, impact, influence in the region. Um, after Qasem Soleimani, the former commander of the Quds Force, was killed, they said this went down to uh, every American, uh, uh, you know, civil society worker, every American professor, journalist, any any trace of influence we have in the region, uh, they want to roll back now. You're, you're, you know, the, the individual you're talking about could say, so what? Uh, except this is a, a region that is vital to the United States from the standpoint of um, its natural resources, right? We have trade alliances, uh, our access to oil, and and um, uh, the Suez the Suez Canal is a major trade route uh, through which mm -hmm. most of the world's shipping goes. So these things they might not seem like they impact us directly, but they will. Beyond that, Iran has allied itself. Uh, with countries like Russia, China, North Korea, Venezuela, all of which want to upend the international order that the United States established in the wake of World War II with hard-fought blood, and which has made the world a safer place for everyone, but particularly for the United States. Without this international order that we put into place, we may have to once again send our boys and girls abroad to die in far-off lands uh, in wars that could have been prevented had this international order been strengthened. Outstanding explanation there, David. Want to have you hang on for just a moment. Want to bring in Rich Goldberg, your colleague, senior fellow. Uh, Rich, you made a really strong point earlier, and in the brief amount of time we have left, just a couple minutes, uh, you said, listen, it, it is important that we not make more of this than might uh, perhaps we might want to. In other words, 6,000 missiles sounds like a massive number, and it is, but compared to the arsenal that Hezbollah has, uh, it, it really is, frankly, a drop in the bucket. And just to give the folks at home a perspective, uh, Hezbollah is believed to be the most heavily armed non-state group in the world. Am I reading you correctly when I say that, Rich? That's exactly right. I mean, the estimate going into tonight was 200,000 missiles, rockets, and drones in the arsenal. So if you take the Israeli estimate of 6,000 that were ready to launch that have been destroyed preemptively, that's 194,000 of some variants of short, medium, long-range rockets, short-range ballistic missiles, drones of various kinds, and other assets as well that they still have in their arsenal. So it is a important step to be able to take out these capabilities when they're being set up to launch, because this would have been a large-scale attack. It does not mean that you are having a victory here strategically when tomorrow and the next day 150 rockets or missiles will still be falling on northern Israel. And I'm glad you mentioned that, too, because for the folks at home who don't know the geography, uh, walk them through. We're not talking about a lot of distance from the Golan Heights and Haifa, even Nazareth. Uh, we got about 35 seconds to go. No, there are towns all across northern Israel going down to central Israel that are within range of all the kinds of different rockets and missiles and drones that Hezbollah has. Within about a two-kilometer to five-kilometer area from the border, you've seen a lot of towns evacuated. But Hezbollah has gone further than that. They have capabilities of 10 kilometers that are just nothing to them, that they're firing off into towns a little further from the border. Once you get into their capabilities of 20, 25 kilometers, you're reaching other cities in northern Israel. 
they've had drones fly over Haifa port and release the video. So their capability is, is quite large. Think 10 times the size and capability, lethality potential than Hamas ever was. That's what Iran built on Israel's northern border to be a deterrent uh, against ever going after Iran's nuclear weapons program. I know I promised that would be the last question, but very quickly, do you numb to the attacks when you live in a place like Haifa? You can't. You can't. Certainly, if you're in a place like Haifa, uh, if the Israelis were to see uh, a direct attack on Haifa port, that would prompt a massive retaliation. But when you go just a little bit north of there, communities all along that border, you cannot allow yourself to fall into a state of normalcy of warfare on a daily basis because kids aren't going back to school, which is going to be starting in just a few weeks in Israel. They're going to be evacuated to someplace else in Israel, living out of a hotel, going to somebody else's mm. school. That is simply unsustainable for a democracy. Remember, Israel's the size of New Jersey. Hezbollah has just decided to make them evacuate Bergen County. That, that can't happen in a democracy. Rich Goldberg and David Dowd from the FDD. Gentlemen, thank you so much, and we hope you'll stand by as we continue our coverage here on Fox News Channel. Uh, the IDF preemptively striking missile sites in Lebanon, uh, some 6,000 missiles at the ready taken out in strategic and precision strikes by the IDF, more than 100 aircraft uh, helping to make that happen. We continue our coverage here on Fox. I'm Kevin Cork in Washington, joined by Chan Lee Painter in New York. Quick break. Our coverage continues after a very quick timeout as Israel attempts once again to defend itself from a potential attack. In the meantime, Chanley, we have uh, Rich Goldberg and David Dowd uh, joining us once again. I want to begin with you, David. And listen, you and I have had a chance to sort of unpack where we have been uh, over the last 24 hours. I'm just curious where you see us going over the next 24 to 48 hours. Do the ceasefire talks continue? Does uh, this hold up in any way? Your thoughts? Um, as far as we can tell, ceasefire talks are going to, to continue. Um, it seems like this will not have an impact on that. I think Hezbollah still uh, has an interest for, uh, itself in allowing these ceasefire talks the possibility of success, because then they can claim that whatever they did this morning and they're already exaggerating what they did this morning. They're claiming the Israelis failed to launch a preemptive strike and so on, that they hit a target, two targets in Tel Aviv. They can claim that that had the effect of pushing the Israelis into accepting a ceasefire and ending their war prematurely. So it's a double win for Hezbollah. Um, if more attacks are coming remains to be seen. Um, I don't think so, uh, given that uh, Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah uh, is uh, set to speak today. Uh, I think uh, this is going to be a, a propaganda victory lap for Hezbollah, uh, complete with all the uh, typical exaggeration. I think they're trying to bridge uh, the gap between reality and the image they want to project uh, to their followers with propaganda. So he's going to double down on the claims that the organization has started to make, uh, that the Israelis failed uh, in launching a preemptive strike that Hezbollah was able to deceive them uh, into into attacking where, uh, you know, where the, the, that Hezbollah essentially launched a feint. And that's where, where, where uh, the Israelis attacked. 